What exactly is an autonomous vehicle? Many of us equate it with a self-driving car, one that transports you automatically all the way from where you are to where you're going with no need for input from you as the passenger at all. It's easy to futurecast how that kind of autonomy will impact how we use our vehicles. We can spend more time re-engaged with our children, or we'll have a new means of mobility for the disabled, or we'll go to sleep as we leave the office on Friday night and wake up in front of a vacation resort on Saturday morning. Through the city, through traffic, over the highway, and into the parking spot, the car just does everything for you. That is still a few years on. But as it turns out, there are actually multiple levels of autonomy in cars, and several of those levels are already on the road today. Those levels of autonomy that we're talking about, and the ones that have been accepted globally, were set out by the International Society of Automotive Engineers, often called SAE. The SAE defines six levels of autonomy in cars, which is sometimes confusing because, as you might expect from a group of very intelligent engineers, the six levels are labeled zero through five. And here's a quick intro. Level zero is the car you likely grew up with, or what some call an old timer. You steer, you accelerate, you brake. At level zero, there is no automation at all. At level one, your car gains some low-level autonomous functions that help with easy tasks, like guiding you back into your lane if you drift, or adjusting the high beams on your headlights. At level two, the car can begin to perceive its environment on its own, like adaptive cruise control and changing lanes based on where you're going and the traffic around you. At level three, well, for the rest of the levels, let me introduce you to Tim Kaiser, who was an engineering team lead at Volkswagen Auto Group and is now a product manager at HERE. And then we hit level three, where a human driver is partially, in some conditions, hands off and eyes off the street. You can imagine a vehicle that hits the highway and then you get an indicator. Now you can put your hands off the wheel and put your feet on the ground because I will take over accelerating, decelerating and steering the vehicle for you. The only difference between level three and four is that in level four of the automation, you can be almost sleeping. And in case of a fallback, the vehicle will tell you, please wake up. I will just drive to an evacuation route or emergency route for you to safely park your car until you take over. Where for level three vehicles, you will have to be back in the loop from dreaming or surfing the web in a couple of seconds. And level five, which is the ultimate goal, is a full automation where you don't even have a steering wheel or pedals anymore. It's practically a cube where you are sitting in driving from A to B and you're just defining the destination. So what can we take away from these six SAE levels? One important note is that with the exception of the very highest level of autonomy, all the others require a human driver as a fallback. Another takeaway is that many of these incremental levels of autonomy, sometimes called HAD for highly autonomous driving, are already on the road. We simply know them by different names. Oh, it's late keeping systems, automatic distance control systems. It's all separate ECUs controlling one or more dimension of, of the actual drive. It's about steering, accelerating, decelerating, but there is no higher level environmental perception on these functions, but it's all different issues controlling different aspects of the vehicle driving. This is going to be changed when you speak about autonomous driving vehicles or highly automated driving. You can call it an autopilot. The autopilot, you know, it has different meanings for various people. I would say that it's just automated driving in certain environments. In the technology world, it is called operational domain design. That is Justina Zander, who earned her PhD in engineering and computer science from Berlin Technical University. She's now the head of mapping and autonomous vehicles at NVIDIA, and she knows a lot about autonomous cars. And so on a highway, you can use autopilot. It's going to drive you from point A to point B, but it's going to be a very simple, straightforward drive on a straight road, and it's going to do it for you. Otherwise, everything else, you, you still have to take over so whenever you hear self-driving on the market today, it is just this autopilot on a straight road. And that's fine. That's the beginning. These are features we know. We hear about them in car commercials and we read about them in magazines. Highway autopilot, lane change assistance, adaptive cruise control, self-parking. But 
even the most complex of these driver assists are still just that, assistance. It's not until we get to SAE level three that the car begins to do the majority of the work and the human driver becomes the assistant. So what will it take to get autonomous cars to level three and above? High reliability, I'd say. When I was developing driver's assistance systems, 99% was what we've been targeting in terms of availability of systems and a failure-free operation. But for autonomous driving cars, 99% sounds great, but this is actually pretty bad. 99%. Imagine an autonomous car where for every 99 turns it gets right, it gets one turn wrong. For driver's assistance systems, you have the human as a fallback because you, the human can always take over. But for an autonomous driving car, this is unacceptable. And this is what's the challenge in this whole automation is like. I like what Tim said about the fallback. I think the fallback is really the key term here, because if you have a human as a fallback, it is still the traditional way of thinking of driving. Whereas if you have a machine as a fallback, it's an entirely different world. That different world. The autonomous world above the 99% reliability mark means we have to put a lot more equipment in the car to interpret what the sensors are reporting. For example, a camera. It's a relatively simple sensor because it's the human that interprets all the visual data that the camera captures. For a computer to accurately and reliably interpret that data, we'll need bigger computers in the car. There are multiple technologies in the car that are responsible for helping you perform the deep learning properly. And this is where NVIDIA comes in and provides the hardware that is actually capable of computing all those sensor inputs at the same time. And you have multiple sensors. You have cameras, lidars, radars, GPUs, IMUs, and whatnot. And the whole thing is that you have to support redundancy and diversity. So you're going to have a lot of sensors that are going to cover for each other in case one of them fails. That makes sense. Lots of sensors, lots of computing power, and both working fast enough to interpret information and react in near real time. What does that mean for any car manufacturer working on an SAE Level 5 car? Or what does it mean for those out there that dream of owning their own autonomous car? This is tremendously expensive. <laughs> if you're talking about Level 3 capabilities, you're talking about a couple thousand euros. If you're talking about fully autonomous driving cars, it's a hundred thousand and more euros for just these systems deployed to the cars. So I don't see level five uh, vehicles owned privately. I really see fleet operation for level five uh, vehicles because of the super expensive equipment you'll have to have. So Justina was already mentioning it. It's about redundancy in the end of the day. You will have all these equipment at least twice in the car and one uh, unit is observing the other to make sure it's just correct. In case of a failure, it just jumps in and makes sure that the vehicle is driving safely from A to B. And this is an equipment you won't have in level three cars. There is a question to consider about computing power, and it's this. Where does that power need to live? In the case of autonomous cars, Justina and Tim agree it has to be done on board the vehicle. But what if future network speeds could be so fast and widely available enough to move processing to a cloud computing solution? Well, as they informed me, I was moving a little too far into the future. I don't think so. Even if you don't have 5G available, you need to drive autonomous or at least highly automated. And limiting this functionality to the uh, mobile cellular coverage network is nothing which is acceptable from a customer standpoint. It's not only the customer, it's also the designer and the technologies behind it. We don't want to rely on unreliable technologies at all. You know, we as humans, we have difficulty relying on anyone. We want to be good at everything because we tend to hesitate when someone else is going to provide something that is critical for our living. There is still an element of computing, which Justina explains, that has to live outside the car. And in a sense, investing in this kind of computing can save manufacturers a great deal of money down the road. Before you go to the car and deploy the whole technology on the production level, you actually have to test it. And testing means proper validation and verification methods. One of them is called simulation. Simulation takes about 50% of the production cost. You have to get it right in the data center before you put it in the car. So you basically simulate the car unit in the data center. 
you simulate the dynamic behavior of the car, but also all the deep learning algorithms that you implemented for the car to be able to drive in the autopilot or in the self-driving mode. And only if this simulation proves to be correct, then you can go on the car and deploy this technology in the car. So what does the future look like? If we look at a realistic timeline, what can we expect in the next 10 years? One thing we can be certain of, more research and more testing. And of course, we'll begin to see more features and tests on the roads, which is a big issue for governments. What will the roads look like when they're populated with both human-driven and machine-driven cars? Exactly like they look like today. <laughs> we'll have an, a heterogeneous uh, environment. We will still have these old timers I was talking about, these cars, and we will have the autonomous driving vehicles, we will have them all on our roads. And I do not expect any autonomous driving specialized uh, traffic signs on the road because we, we never made these roads for machines. And I don't expect this going to, to be changed in the future. I think we're going to see autopilot mode cars a lot. I don't think we're going to see the self-driving, the fully self-driving cars on a typical road. And for the fully self-driving uh, capabilities, I think we're gonna have geofenced uh, regions where these cars are driving, like on the campus, we already see it at the airport. You know, we see it in manufacturing uh, facilities. So we're gonna see more and more. So it's gonna come, but it's gonna go slowly, uh, gradually, and for various regions. They may be even closed for the typical cars. A full SAE Level 5 autonomous car might be a little further off than we think at first, or even further off than some manufacturers are promising. There's no doubt that multiple car makers want to be the first to claim higher levels of autonomy in their vehicles. What's evident is that there are multiple transitions that have to take place first. There are transitions in how we use the roads. How will autonomous vehicles behave when interacting with a human driver? Is there a difference when that interaction takes place on a quiet suburban street versus in New York City gridlock? There are transitions in consumer expectations. What do people want from their cars? Do they want to simply be taken from A to B? Or is their car an expression of freedom and fun? Are we taking the fun out of cars? I wouldn't say that we are taking the fun away. We just like, replace it with something else. As I'm saying, for the next decades, we're still going to drive. So this fun is not going to go away. And uh, there will be times where you can switch between different modes, driving or not driving, fallback for humans or not. I know there are companies who claim they will never go self-driving just because they're sports cars. And I'm actually curious how it is going to evolve for them. Because those same companies said we will never go electric and now they do. That's a good point. People don't necessarily know what they want. But for the moment, we can know what we look forward to. I asked Justina and Tim what they were looking forward to. Tim is looking forward to seeing the technology that he's spent his career developing come to life. I was working in the automotive industry on like traditional sensors like radar, LiDAR, camera. And all these sensors perceive the environment for a very short range of sight. I decided to work for here because I figured out, even when I was at the OEM side, that maps could really improve the range of sight tremendously. Because the map doesn't have the limitation all these traditional sensors have. And I could see that environmental perception and fusion could fuse map content to enhance the range of sight. And this is practically unlimited. And this is what is really inspiring me on a technological side. On a private level, I'm really amazed at some point in time to see an actual vehicle with the technology inside where I just tried to shape it to make it successful. And, and this is what's motivating me when I'm walking around the city. For Justina, it's about building bigger simulations. I've been always a very huge enthusiast and also designer of the simulation technology. So I deeply believe that simulating the way the fleet behaves in the world in various corner cases, various circumstances, various countries, various cultures is going to be the next big wave for advancing the autonomous vehicles industry. That's something that I'm really, really excited. And on top of this, it's not about the functionality of the simulation as such, but also you want to scale this up. So you need a huge infrastructure if you want to simulate the whole world. For the rest of us, we all likely have our own image of how cars will be part of our future. For some of us who like the thrill of driving, it might mean no autonomy at all. For those whom a car is simply a means of getting from A to B conveniently, we can expect 
that highly autonomous driving features will improve and make that experience as easy as possible. Personally, I would still love to get in my car on a Friday night and wake up at a B&B in Vermont on Saturday morning. We'd like to thank Justina Zander of NVIDIA and Tim Kaiser of HERE for their time and insight into this subject. And thank you very much for listening to this episode of the HERE Technologies podcast. To learn more about autonomous vehicle technologies, artificial intelligence, fleet management, tracking, indoor maps, developer solutions, location intelligence, or any of the other things that HERE Technologies does, visit HERE.com. Thanks for listening.